Everyone is talking about agents, multi-agents. Let's see a master agent chef in action here on the Cozy AI Kitchen. I'm so pleased to have my colleague, the VP of product in Azure AI and AI Futures, Marco Casalina, to teach us all how to cook with AI and agents. Welcome, Marco. Hello, John. How are you doing? How are you? Is it, is, is it cold in there? You look kind of okay there, but... Ooh, but you know what? I got some stuff cooking. It's going to warm it right up. Ah, the power of the grill. Well, Marco, can you say a few sentences about what you're going to talk, what you're going to be cooking with us? Well, all right. We got some stuff going on here. So we are going to be looking at AI agents. And I know you've had a number of folks building some AI agents on the cozy kitchen before, but this time, uh, you know, ChatGPT has convinced everybody that AI is for question answering. You type to it, it types to you. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer, and it does do that. But the fact is, it's so much more than that. It can take actions, especially with these new agent frameworks. So today, we're going to look at an AI that can actually take action on your behalf, and that's going to be a single agent. And then I'm going to go also into uh, a new multi-agent that I built to help me do my own job. This sounds so delicious, Marco. We have agents, that's why we have the uh, Cozy AI Kitchen Microwave, but we're going to see you cook it on your laptop. Go for it, Marco. Chef Casalina. Right. <laughs> Let's do this. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, assistance. The OpenAI assistance framework is a single agent framework. And uh, I'm using it in Azure OpenAI, uh, as I would do because I here at Microsoft. So I have built an agent that does something very special. This agent can take actions. It can actually make bookings on my calendar. So I'm going to make it do something funky here. Check this out. Now, before I get into it, I am running this in the Azure AI Assistant tool. So the Azure AI Assistant tool, you can get this on GitHub too. It is a really useful kind of a local harness to be able to test your assistance. And in this case, I'm running it locally because I'm going to have it do a bunch of local stuff, as you're going to see. I'm going to have it do a bunch of things on my computer. So I'm going to kick this thing off right now. Let's take a look at the run view here to see what it's doing while it's doing it. Now, one of the powers that I've given it is to get some files from one directory on my laptop. That's what it's doing here. Now it found a file here. And the file that it found is this. Calendar. So I'm coming to you live. That's right. So this is a PDF calendar. I'm coming to you live from Piedmont, California. Woo! This is my daughter's school calendar. <laughs> and down here in April, this is the upcoming spring break, April 7th hmm. through the 11th. So back to where we were. All right. So here's what happened here. Uh, so it got the file. It found this file. Now, I've also given it the ability. You see this get image layout from file. That's actually calling Azure Document Intelligence. And Azure Document Intelligence is a set of small task-specific models that are made to read PDFs. This is a PDF, so it's perfect. So it reads this thing, small models and agents are friends, and this is uh, one example of it. And then it finds my date, time, and time zone. So here I am at Pacific time. And so it has discovered, indeed, April 7th through the 11th, 2025, and it's asking me, shall I proceed to ask to add this to your calendar? And I will say, proceed. Now, let's watch my calendar for a second. So here we are in the calendar. No okay. hands, no hands. That was not me. That was the assistant logging into my calendar. So it just Whoa. pulled off into my calendar. Uh, oh, and there it is. What? <laughs> so we have, it, it's made the entry on my calendar for Piedmont School Spring Break in April 2025. Now, if we really dig into this, the truth is I didn't exactly program it to do this. I mean, this is the thing about agents is that mm -hmm. the point about them is that they can reason out how to do tasks using the powers that you give them. And so if we look at how this is actually made, well, I mean, I have this meta prompt here. So mm -hmm. I said, you're a scheduling assistant, helps you manage their calendars. You describe it in great detail. You request permission of the user before you do anything. That's what it did, right? It asked me if it could proceed in Outlook and so on. 
And then I gave it these tools. I gave it these powers. And these powers are to look up an outlook and to add to outlook. And you saw them all being used in this case. Now, what that means is that I can ask it to do just about anything on my calendar. I mean, in this case, I asked it to add the spring break, but I could have said, make a recurring meeting every Tuesday at 3 p.m. or something like that. And it could have done that too, because it has the power to add to Outlook. But if I ask it to delete something from my calendar, it can't do it because I didn't give it a delete from Outlook power. And, and Marco, now, it's important that you're giving it that power. It's a choice. Exactly. I have chosen to give it that power. And speaking of which, here's how I did it. So these are the powers themselves. So this is in Python now. This is the code behind what we see here. And so like if we look at add to Outlook, for example, here's the add to Outlook power. It's just a user function that I defined. And so this is where I kind of OAuth in. And then I kind of call the graph API over here to uh, add it to Outlook. And so this is what it's calling when it's adding to Outlook. Now, let's say that I wanted to uh, add a delete a delete function. So I can just say here, if I just mimic one of my other functions, user function, and you see GitHub uh, Copilot filling this in, delete from Outlook. OK, and it should probably write that for me now. But there it is. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. And so now it's written for me a delete from Outlook, which I can now declare as a tool in my assistant. And so to declare it as a tool, well, part of it is you have to write the code for it here. But the other part of it is that you also have to give it a sort of a meta prompt. So I would go and describe what this function is, what it does, what parameters it takes in natural language and text. And it uses that to decide what the tool is and when to call it. And, and Marco, as an AI, and Marco, as an AI developer, you know, you're using GitHub Copilot to your point. You're using AI to cook as well. You better believe it, man. I, I use the <laughs> heck out of GitHub Copilot, especially in Python. Honestly, Python is not my strong suit. I'm really good at C Sharp and Java and C++ and stuff like that. Mm. Not as much in Python, but wow, this is a, <laughs> it's a wonderful tool to have. Mm. So that's an example of an agent that takes action on your behalf and kind of how you can use this to take action. And indeed, this is available today. I mean, anybody can do this. You can do this right now if you wanted to. So that's a single agent though. I mean, what we saw here was that there was kind of one monolithic agent in assistance that's running the whole show and it decides what to do in every circumstance. And, and, and Chef but, Marco, can you comment on the assistance API? I see threads there. Could you like mention that as well, please? Uh, well, yeah, the assistance API itself. Uh, well, there's the notion of the assistant, right? So I kind of showed a little bit of the setup of the assistant itself, and you can set it up here, you can set it up in the SDK, or you can set it up on the web in Azure AI Studio. Uh, but regardless, you set up the assistant, you kind of give it its overall instructions, and you can give it assistant level files, right? So you can give it a set of knowledge that it can uh, you know, go use. And then you have a thread. And so here, as you can see, I make many threads here. I started a thread. And in a thread, you can also give it files. So you can give it knowledge that's specific to that thread. So I could have said here, block off my Outlook calendar, and here's the PDF for you. In this case, I had preloaded the PDF as an assistant level piece of knowledge that it can get to. Uh, or you can even give it the ability to go do a web search if you want. And in this case, I didn't give it that power. So I gave it the power only to restrict its knowledge set to the local set of files that I have in the directory I made available to it. You're making this look really easy, Chef Marco. Is it really that easy? Uh, you know, it's not that hard, honestly. I mean, it didn't take me that long to write this stuff. And the amount of code that I actually wrote to, to do this, to add these user functions, is small. It's only maybe 100 or more lines, not a lot. Uh, I mean, honestly, the hardest part of all of this was figuring out the Microsoft Graph API. <laughs> that was a challenge. Awesome, thank you. Let's keep cooking. This is amazing. All right, so I have a pretty interesting job and part of my job is also that I often have to fill out these kinds of questionnaires and RFPs and things like that. So that's part of my job is that I work with customers a lot. And a couple of weeks ago, I decided that it was time to automate that part of my job and make it easier for me to do that part of my job. So I wrote this, it's a questionnaire multi-agent. 
So this is a multi-agent system that I can use to answer these customer questions on RFPs. And this is actually a real question that I got on one of these questionnaires, which is, does your service offer video generative AI? I'm hmm. gonna ask this question and we'll see it in action. So let's go ahead and do this. And I will say upfront that as of this recording, uh, Microsoft Azure AI does not offer a video generative AI service. We don't have one yet uh, generally available. Okay, and this question, and I use this question for a reason, it has a tendency to provoke an argument here. Hmm. Uh, and so now I will readily admit that my questionnaire multi-agent is not perfect yet. I'm still working on it. And every day I make a little tweak uh, to try to fix it up. But I have four agents in this set right four. now anyway mm. four so i got my question answer agent and that's that does a first pass here so the question answer agent has the ability to search the web in this case with bing and it does that and it answers the question then i have an answer checker agent and of course this is the idea with multi-agent systems is that each one of these agents has a different specialty and they can even have different models in this case i'm using gpt 40 for everything uh, the next one that I'm working on, maybe the next time I'm on the cozy kitchen, I'll show you that one. Uh, I'm working on a multi-model, multi-agent system. So Whoa. I hope to have up and running soon. Yum. But anyway, so the answer checker agent, that agent's job is to check the answer and make sure that it's uh, correct. And here, the answer checker agent looks at this and the answer checker is not that happy with this thing. Uh, and it says, Microsoft Azure AI does not offer a dedicated video generative AI service, which like I said, as of this recording, is true. I also made a link checker agent because when I first started doing this, I discovered that the question answer had a tendency to hallucinate links. It would make up links mm. that looked like totally plausible links that didn't actually exist. <laughs> so I had to make an agent to fix that. And then we have the manager agent. And the manager agent kind of looks at everybody else's responses and decides whether uh, to approve this response. Let's see, okay, and down at the bottom here, when we when this argument finally concludes, uh, we've had multiple rewrite passes, and at, at the end here, we see answer correct, links correct, and manager agent says approve. So we've achieved a final answer here for this questionnaire. So that's how this system works. The manager agent basically is the decision maker that can decide whether we need to do a rewrite pass or not. And this is a, a great way to approach things like hallucination is, to use a multi-agent system to force a rewrite pass. I just want to note here for the listeners out there, uh, Chef Marco is doing an expert uh, method of working with multi-agents where he's making them very expert, narrow skills. He also mentioned task-specific models before as well. Uh, as uh, Chef Marco is demonstrating to us, you have to really focus the attention of what the agent does. Is that correct, Chef Marco? That is correct. And actually, if you like, we can take a look at how I did that. Awesome. Well, it's not a ton of code, honestly. Now, in this case, uh, for this multi-agent system, I used Semantic Kernel. And I used uh, the relatively new Semantic Kernel multi-agent system, which is pretty elegantly done. Uh, and as a result of that, there's actually not a lot of code here. I mean, I have, you see there's more tabs of code here, but a lot of this is just the window itself that I'm rendering it and making it pretty and stuff like that. This here is my core multi-agent class here where all the good stuff is happening. And so these are the pieces that I'm using here, semantic kernel, semantic kernel agents, and the Bing plugin and the OpenAI plugin, as I mentioned earlier. So if we kind of scroll down to where I'm defining the agent prompts, now each one of these agents has a prompt. As I said before, at least right now, I'm using the same model for each one of these agents, uh, GPT-40. Uh, in the future, I may actually go use different models for different agents. But uh, I specialize each one of these agents with a specialized prompt. So you are a question and answerer for the context here was Microsoft Azure AI, but I could do this for anything, right? So when I go to a customer site, for example, I can change it to that customer's name and ask a question that's relevant to them and it still works, which is awesome. So uh, you're the question answerer, you're the answer checker, stuff like that. You're the link checker, you're the manager. So I give them each their respective responsibilities and then I define a kernel. Now, as I understand it, there is one kernel per model. And in this case, I'm using all one kernel. All the agents are using this one kernel, but in my next agent that I want that I'm working on, <laughs> I will have multiple kernels, uh, one for each model that I want to use. 
adding the Bing connector mm. was remarkably easy. So here's the Bing connector. This is all the code I need to do for the Bing connector, but I did need to have a Bing resource defined in Azure to connect it to. That's where this API key is coming from. But actually adding that Bing search was two lines of code, literally. Uh, and then I define each agent like so, using the chat completion agent. And for those that I want to give access to that Bing connector, I give them auto invoke kernel functions like so. So I define each one of these agents like so. And then we run it. And I said, I have my termination strategy that basically says, when the manager says approve, you're done. Or if you hit the maximum iterations of 25, because there have been cases where it would have resulted in an infinite argument if I didn't have a maximum iterations in there. And so I set it to 25 so that we don't have infinite arguments here. Uh, and that's really all there is to it. Then we take the question, mm -hmm. we run it, and away we go. So first of all, out, out there, I'm applauding here in the studio here for Chef Marco's <laughs> cooking. Uh, thank you, Chef Marco. Um, you know, um, I'm having an emotional moment now because I remembered in December of last year, Semantic Kernel, uh, when I was working on that project, we moved quickly to agents. And I bought this microwave oven <laughs> and brought it to the studio to signify agents as a new paradigm. And to see you, Chef Marco, cook like this for all of us, thank you, so inspiring. You know, Chef Marco, do you have some sort of parting words for developers out there? To your, to, you were saying like, I'm a C++ deterministic coding person, but I'm doing this. How can they make this transition to agents the way you have? Do you have any advice for them? Well, I guess the first thing is you have to recognize that AI agents uh, can take action. So with my first agent, I made it take action. And, and you do want to think past just question answering, past just RAG, although you can use agents for a better RAG, which is what I did with my multi-agent thing. Uh, they can also now be increasingly effective in taking actions and integrating to third-party systems and actually doing things on your behalf. It's not that hard to get into. That's that's a big piece of it too. It's, it's remarkably simple to get into it. And with this multi-agent system like this, you can use these multi-agents and this, what we call the debating agent pattern to improve correctness, to improve the likelihood that your AI is going to achieve the response, the result that you're looking for. Well, thank you for bringing agents to the kitchen. Uh, this is a wonderful moment for the kitchen, having uh, Chef Marco here. Uh, watch all your videos, got to watch your live talks. Um, Thank you for bringing your chefness, Chef Marco. Uh, for all those of you out there who want to keep learning, just come on with us. Thank you.